Hey guys, welcome to the first episode of Class Compiled with Syntax Errors. I'm your host Bhavi Singh and I'm here with Anish. Hello guys. Gulati. Yo. And Kushagra. Hi there. These guys are with the programming club and this is their job. Well, that's it. But that is not why we do w- the way we do it. Because programming, you see, is like the number 42. So programming is the answer to the life, universe and everything. Okay. So, programming can achieve basically anything where, where we want to apply systematic problem solving using a machine. And that is the reason why we love it. And also, we do it because we are good at it. <laughs> <laughs> so, basically, I believe that everyone can and should program. So, even now, all the tasks nowadays are being automated and uh, everything is shifting to machines. Well, you know what? I think we've reached beyond the stage where everything is being done by machines and we have reached a level where machines are doing, where machines are creating machine programs to do the task. So I'm talking about auto ML here. That's a pretty new area which has completely revolutionized DL, deep learning. So the problem that we've historically had with deep learning algorithms is that they're pretty complex, you know, millions and millions of parameters and no one doesn't understand what's going so I have heard that they took a lot of time to actually execute. Yeah, so I, as far as I remember, a single GPU took five years for a complex deep learning algorithm to train. And the issue associated it with that is that if you have to experiment, then you can't have to run a five experiment and then run a five experiment. Run kar. You need to hit the mark bang on. And that's where AutoML comes important. It gives you the best structure which should be for problem. Ke liye hona so just data set though and you get the perfect model for that. So, I PhDs, but AutoML has made deep learning into pretty accessible stuff. It's really great. So, you are telling me that the current research which PhDs and MS people are doing is basically trash? Not exactly trash. Deep ML, deep, uh, sorry, AutoML will definitely help them in that. But yeah, I don't respect it. So, but you are saying that it will be accessible to all. But if the GPUs take too much time, how will everyone get the access to such GPUs. Yeah, that's an issue. I think uh, advancements in cloud computing, etc., they will be an important part of it. Well, that's true. Cloud computing has actually made uh, significant strides in the past few years. Hmm. Look, if we look at Google, which has been at the forefront of this innovation, Unka Stadia, which is basically their uh, current, mo- uh, current mobile uh, and you know basically gaming infrastructure based on cloud networks what they are doing is you only need to have the google chrome browser which everyone has and without any uh, uh, gpu you will be able to actually play full-fledged triple a titles gaming titles on the go full hd 60 frames per second so i'll be able to play gta 5 on my pc without actually having a titan 1080 that's true you you only will need you only will need um a very good and stable internet connection 50 100 mbps sort of like that <laughs> but bro malab, talking about that are we really comfortable with sharing our data on the cloud malab? let's look at what happened with facebook right are we we had the cambridge analytica incident mm-hmm. where facebook leaked the data of more than half of its users and the companies are basically used are able to manipulate that right so are we really comfortable with giving all of that data to companies like but Google. I guess we can stop that right so crypto is making strides in uh, that field so we are coming up with a technique called FHE FHE is fully homomorphic encryption what fully homomorphic encryption does is that we are able to compute stuff on encrypted data itself so I don't actually need to look at your data to find values related to that data so all the ML algorithms and everything just runs on encrypted uh, on your encrypted data that's in the cloud so oh, nice so Facebook would not actually need to see your data and wouldn't, wouldn't even have your data. It would just have an encrypted form of it. So in a nutshell, you mean to say that the cloud server which is processing my information, computing my data, does not really know what that data is, does not even know what form the data is in. Yeah, I am exactly saying that. And it's just not limited to that. So there is something we call zero knowledge proof of knowledge. So a zero knowledge proof of knowledge is that I give you 
oh, uh, I possess some knowledge. I don't actually want to give you that knowledge, but I want to prove that I possess that knowledge. So, so basically, that is me in exam hall. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, basically. So, uh, but there is something, something more useful than that. So, <laughs> so uh, like uh, banks and stuff, they do not actually want to reveal how much money they have, but they still want to prove that they clear some cut off for some loaners. Say. Mm-hmm. So they can just show that using zero knowledge proof of knowledge. And so how ex- exactly how relevant it is pretty relevant as we can see but how um, easy it is to actually do it on a pro- uh, on a typical real world system. Yeah because as I've seen that crypto mm-hmm. algorithms generally take a lot of time to run right. Yeah. And if you just change the basic operations mm-hmm. it will <laughs> So exactly. So it takes a lot of computing power. So Intel was making ga- ga- great strides in this. So they came up with an n-graph library, but hmm. uh, that s- uh, still requires a lot of processing power. And I don't know if Intel would be able to do it. Well, I doubt it because Intel was at the forefront of innovation a few years back, banging on their um, Moore's law, which was coined by their very famous founder, which said that the number of transistors would almost double in every 18 or so months, which was true up up to a few years ago, but now it has slowed down. So what happens is in a transistor, the size of the transistor, which is basically nanometer regime right now, is responsible for the power consumption and also the performance of the whole system. So what, what will be the typical size of the processor that is on installed on my PC? So the processor itself is really small, like one inch square, let's mm-hmm. say. But the transistor is extremely tiny. It is in the 10 nanometer regime. Okay. So what happens is that the smaller it is, the more power efficient and the more powerful your system would be. So mm-hmm. what Intel is doing is it is currently on 10 nanometer scale, whereas the competitors AMD, Qualcomm, Nvidia, they are all on the 7 nanometer scale, which is significantly more powerful. And hmm. Intel is basically lagging behind. So, but uh, isn't just making it smaller and smaller inducing problems. So I heard about quantum computing. So yes, yeah. that is the case. So if we go into the sub nanometer scale below one nanometers, it act the quantum entanglement and quantum mechanical phenomena do play a very, very significant role. Yeah. So like, I mean that uh, in quantum computing, basically if the processor becomes smaller and smaller, there is entanglement as you said. So shouldn't we actually uh, like Feynman proposed that we should actually take advantage of that and use that to our computational uh, algorithm so we rewrite a- every algorithm accounting for the computer uh, for the quantum entanglement and even using it to our advantage and making our algorithms faster and faster so basically you're talking about building a qu- uh, quantum computer yeah okay. <laughs> so, so <laughs> is there currently a quantum computer in existence uh, yeah, IBM has one, but it's pretty small. So uh, uh, it has very small computing power as of right now. But theoretically, we have lots of algorithms related to quantum computers. So like there is one that uh, factorizes numbers. So uh, the one that factorizes numbers actually does it really fast. It uh, And it can actually break the RSA code and just uh, finish all of the crypto systems. So, so quantum computers basically can break down our current crypto crypto systems. Yeah. So well, if, if quantum computers are that fast, can I can I achieve the same effect I was using with Stadia by using quantum computers? Can I use quantum computers to actually play GTA 5? Mm-hmm. Uh, I guess yes, but for that you will need a quantum information channel and a quantum processor that is big enough. Let's just say it will take quite a while. To quite a, <laughs> yeah, it would take quite a while to achieve that. <laughs> but coming back to reality, Intel and AMD basically also have their fair share of problems. So there is these vulnerabilities, very, very significant vulnerabilities called Spectre and Meltdown, hmm. which basically make every sing- almost every single current processor vulnerable to a very significant attack. So what happens is if you are running a code which has three lines, say line one, line two and line three, you would expect that line one runs before line two and which mm. runs before line three. Mm. But in our current processes, I would say that this is not exactly how it goes. Line two can run before line one and line three can run before line two. It is out of order execution of code. And that is what is causing these problems like Spectre and Meltdown, where attackers can actually use this information 
to their advantage to know very very secret and significant information about us mm-hmm. so That's are right. they using the software thing to do it or are they doing it something physically on the cpu so it is a software based attack so it can be a software based attack you can use basically your kernel level code to take out information from basically anywhere from the cpu and mm-hmm. that is why it is very significant you don't need physical access to the device really okay mm-hmm. now coming back to something i talked before uh, coming here to the podcast with kushagra was natural language processing yeah so very what what's actually happened in these days is that there has been a revolution in nlp a revolution on the scale of what happened in computer vision right where we boosted the accuracy from 50 60% to more than 90% so what's actually happened is that the problem that people had with N- nlp was that you can't process words right you need to represent these words as vectors jiske upar tum apne math run karoge basically right so what uh, google has been able to do through its word model is contextual representation so talking about why that is important is let me give an example let's say ki if we represent bank you know bank can be two meanings it can be river bank or it can be the monetary bank mm-hmm. so representing that as a single vector is a problem mm-hmm. right because let's say if i represent it as the first one and i use it as the second one then the model will be fucked mm-hmm. so essentially you can say context matters yeah so the importance of context here really is so important that with contextual representation that we have had through elmo layers and uh, was what basically the word model does is that you give it a language model you give it your embeddings and this embeddings improve over time to capture the context and capturing the ca- context basically is the essential part because in nlp basically you play with the semantics you understand ki abhi tak sentence mein kya kya hua hai and then you go on to predict ki okay what the next word will be and an essential part of doing that is understanding the sentence right so you are telling me that to know what i am going to speak next it is better to have a context it is better to know what i have already spoken about mm. and you can you, you can guess better what what i am going to speak yeah exactly and that's where uh, this context becomes important and it has basically beaten all the state of the art models and i don't really under- i can i can't really fathom where the extent of this model will go google although has monopolized it but mm-hmm. it's it's going to be huge so has google monopolized it because google has a lot of data on us and it just computes nlp algorithms <laughs> on it so <laughs> yeah well, that, that would be, be one of the uh, that would be one of the so reasons, each time so. i do hello google so does it use nlp to do things uh well a lot of people are doing hello uh, hello Google at the same time so Google doesn't store that data so what actually happens is that all this data is being passed to Google server and it doesn't use that it has this online algorithms which keep updating its nlp model at the time so you don't need actually need to store the data so you just pass it through the algorithm and it's dumped to thrash so something that i read was that re- uh, reinforcement learning does not actually require data so can companies with no data at all use reinforcement learning to do nlp Uh, well reinforcement learning is a completely different paradigm and that's the paradigm of ml which excites me the most so for just for an introduction what that does is that you know you can relate it to every task that humans want to do what we want is the optimal and the best way of doing things and that's what rl does for you reinforcement learning it gives you the best policy through which you want to do any task task ranging from anything literally tra- traveling on the moon finding where the chocolate cake is hidden shooting doing down this, doing this podcast <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> doing the fast podcast coming up with better segways <laughs> <laughs> so uh, current advance advancements in rl which have been possible through cloud tpus etc have made this possible so the problem earlier with rl was that the representation of the model became too complex you just couldn't do that for complex complex models although the algorithms do exist you can't really apply them bahut time lag jayega you won't be able to finish in a, in a single lifetime so taking a long shot because because of the fact that we can now right now actually process those algorithms and execute them so in the future can we have this terminator like situation where an rl model uh, predicts what would be the best course for say earth and says that well human are not in the optimal path so they just try to you know <laughs> distract us Uh, well on a sci-fi level that may be true but for that you'll need to model the whole universe and if you've done that then you've basically created god that's a lot of computation i would yeah, say uh, <laughs> exactly a lot of computation all of achieving quantum computers <laughs> that will come before that for sure so that will be the end of our first podcast class compiled with syntax errors thank you guys <laughs>